Uh, this man may be familiar to you. He is, um, uh, has been connected with the phenomenon of fake news one way or another. Uh, on the receiving end of many claims of being uh, a purveyor of fake news, lots of people saying that the, the things that he tweets are, are, are not necessarily true uh, or even are completely untrue. Um, he maintains that uh, much of the mainstream media, uh, CNN in particular, is a purveyor of fake news and is just out to, uh, to get him. And so there's claims and counterclaims of what's true and what's, what's false. But with the presidential campaign of 2016, and the Brexit referendum in UK in 2016, the whole issue of fake news took on a level of importance that it had um, not had previously. It's not that fake news is a new thing. We'd had plenty of fake news before. As long as the world has had politicians, we've had fake news. Um, as long as human beings have been uh, telling each other about issues of importance, there have been, there's been fake news. So it's not a new thing in some ways, but the particular circumstances that we have, the particular phenomenon of fake news as it is at the moment, is uh, quite a new thing. It has some very distinctive features. So we need to understand the phenomenon of fake news. We need to understand what causes it, how it spreads, and how we counteract it. So understanding the phenomenon of fake news. Uh, first, uh, we'll go over this very briefly, the, the changing landscape of public discourse. I don't need to tell you, of course, how much it's changed in the last, well, say 12 years. 12 years ago, we did not have Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or WhatsApp or Facebook or YouTube. They're, they're all that recent, and yet they're so much a part of our life that it's almost impossible to imagine life without them now. Um, even, even Google is only, uh, oh, can I get, I don't know that I can get the dates of this right. Uh, late 1990s, I think, um, Google, um, very end of the 90s. Uh, and of course, quite a stir when it, when it first came out. But of course, the, the, the World Wide Web itself only goes back to 1990 invented by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN. And so it's radically changed the, um, the media landscape because it has put into ordinary people's hands the power to communicate messages to a vast number of people uh, uh, with a very low threshold barrier, very easy access, and it's possible to, to generate some quite big followings and for, for things to spread. And alongside that, of course, as a direct result of that has been the decline in established media. Uh, as the, well, let me just give you this quote from Emily Bell first from the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia. She used to be the editor in chief of the Guardian newspaper group in the UK. Uh, social media hasn't just swallowed journal journalism, it has swallowed everything. Our news ecosystem has changed more dramatically in the past five years than perhaps at any time in the past 500. And uh, that's a strong claim, but uh, a well-founded one. So just as a comparison, it's, it's not a fair comparison, but I'll give it to you anyway. In the last quarter of 2017, the New York Times made $22.7 million profit. It wasn't a good quarter for them. Uh, it was down quite considerably from earlier in the year. Uh, but compare it to Facebook's profits, $4.3 billion in the same period. Now, it's not a fair comparison because Facebook is global. New York Times is, is North America, is, is, is the USA specifically. So it's not, it's not fair. But the ord th this is three orders of magnitude bigger than, than the profits of the New York Times. And Facebook is, is only about 10 years old. Uh, so... Or, yes, it has a global reach, and that, and that does change everything. But it just shows how insignificant mainstream media have become in the face of, of social media. Um, because the, the advertising has gone online. It's very difficult for established media, print media, uh, and even television media to attract advertising in, in, in the way that it pre did previously, because so much goes online. And of course, the, um, the online media, Facebook and, and the rest, they need to sell clicks and likes and shares. They need to, to sell user data in order to be able to, to sell their advertising. And so we who use Facebook, we are the product. We are the product who are sold to the advertisers. 
So why do we have fake news in the way that we have it at the moment? Uh, firstly, because of political agendas. And um, in the history of um, public lying, uh, political agendas have driven most of that. Um, it's a, a long and ignominious, ignominious story uh, of public lying. Uh, but public, uh, political agendas are behind much of the fake news. So the two campaigns I've mentioned already are explicitly political in nature. Much of the fake news during the American presidential campaign turned out to originate from one town in Macedonia, uh, the creation of um, a sizable group of, um, of older teenage, mostly boys, who discovered that by, by setting up fake news sites that looked something like the Boston Globe or the New York Times or, or whatever, uh, some, some artificial in, imitation website full of spurious fake stories, particularly ones critical of uh, the, uh, the Clinton campaign uh, or of the Democrats generally, that they could sell masses of advertising. And the site only needed to exist for two or three weeks. And if it was exposed, that's fine. Just trash that one and, and create a new one. They discovered they made much less money creating fake news ag against the, the, <laughs> the Republicans and Trump than they did the other way around, which was why there was this big imbalance in, uh, in fake news during that campaign. Uh, so actually, that was driven by greed. It, was, it seemed to be political, but it actually wasn't being, much of that fake news was actually being driven by pure greed, not by the political agendas. But in a, in a polarized political space as we have, uh, always you, you have uh, claims and counterclaims and the, it has become so polarized, the middle ground has, has gone to a large extent. And so what becomes in, most important is that I'm in, I'm in an embattled position over here. The enemy are in an embattled position over there. And rather than meeting in the middle to, to talk about areas of common interest, bipartisan politics, and all the rest of it, um, it's, it's a question of lobbying and ammunition over their defenses. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's true ammunition or if it's false ammunition. What matters is that I'm inflicting a wound on them. And so they're doing the same back. So it, it just escalates into a, into a, a trading of fake news. Uh, this is the Wired story from uh, uh, early 2017 um, that um, broke the, the, the or it, you know, publicized the story of the, the Macedonian fake news factory. Very interesting story, worth finding online. Um, third reason is that uh, virality, the number of clicks and shares, matters more than truth or quality. What I was saying just now about we are the product and the advertisers uh, by us and our data from Facebook. Um, so it matters immensely to Facebook that we click and like and share things because that's, that creates the data to sell. Uh, so they want to encourage us to have our news feeds full of things that we're going to respond to and, and, and love. Um, it, that's what's behind the change of the Facebook algorithm so that it gives us lots of things that we want to see and it doesn't give us the things that we don't want to see. Um, but a fake news story, of course, is, is inevitably, by its nature, somewhat sensational. So it's going to get a response. And because it gets the response, it gets shared, it gets liked, or it gets the angry emojis or whatever it might be. But, but there's a reaction to it. And that reaction means it's more sellable to advertisers. Um, uh, not that it's broken down to, to quite that level. but, but, but but that's what generates the, the traffic flow. Um, and so it matters much more than truth or quality. You may be familiar with the website Gawker that's now gone uh, because of uh, uh, a series of uh, actions brought against it, funded by Peter Thiel. Um, but Gawker thrived on uh, sensationalist stories. And Nitzan Zimmerman, who was, who was responsible for 85% of the traffic on Gawker at one point, uh, he said, it doesn't matter whether it's true, it just matters whether people like it and, and share it. And, and, and the truth doesn't matter. It's just, it's just got to spread. And then another factor is just simple carelessness. Fake news spreads because we don't bother checking our sources. Um, I was caught out on something just yesterday. I came across uh, a piece of information back in 1997 and um, this seemed to be uh, a perfectly reasonable, I mean, a surprising piece of information about um, the state of Alabama passing a law um, to redefine pie. 
so that it was, uh, it was consistent with a, a young earth creationist reading of, of, of scripture. So pi was redefined to be three. Um, and I mean, this was a very surprising story, but it seemed to be a legitimate source. And so I have spent the last 11 years believing the story and discovered yesterday it's actually not true. So there we are. I was careless, I didn't check my sources. Um, I, I was surprised, but not surprised enough to do a little bit of digging. Um, uh, so that's just carelessness, and there's a lot of that around. We're all guilty of it. And then most fundamentally, we live in a post-truth context. Post-truth was uh, defined as the word of the year by, um, or named as word of the year by Oxford Dictionaries in um, 2016, very end of 2016. Um, they said that the word wasn't new. It goes back at least to 1992, but its increase in use w went up by 2,000% during 2016 in those campaigns, um, political campaigns. And they say that post-truth relates to circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotional appeals. What matters is the emotional response to a piece of information or alleged information, a piece of data. Um, and that is, is, is the most significant thing. So the, 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 uh, the Brexit bus with this outrageous claim of 350 million pounds a week that could go into the National Health Service of the UK, completely spurious, but it didn't matter because it created the emotional response that the, uh, the Brexit campaign needed. Abdul Murray is uh, an American, who former Muslim, and he's just published this uh, book, Saving Truth. Finding Meaning and Clarity in a Post-Truth World. Uh, it's, it's not out in, in the UK yet. It's out, it came out in the US a couple of weeks ago. It's available on Kindle. Uh, and I started reading it just a, a day before I came here. So I've only read uh, three or four chapters of it. So I, I can't give you a fully uh, uh, unqualified commendation because it could be that the last few chapters are complete rubbish. But I, it, it started off very well. So at the moment, I'm happy to say I think this is a great book. Certainly a great first half. I'm sure the second half is just as good, um, but I don't want to be found guilty of uh, giving false recommendations if it, <laughs> if it turns out that the last few chapters are rubbish. Anyway, he says in, um, early on in that book, post-truth has two, mo two modes. The first is a soft mode, by which I mean we may acknowledge that truths exist or that certain things are true, but we don't care about the truth if it gets in the way of our personal preferences. The second mode is hard, by which a I mean a willingness to propagate blatant falsehoods, knowing they're false, because doing so serves a higher political or social agenda. So, so both are around, both discount truth in different ways, but the second says, I know this is a lie and I don't care, um, and I'm going to put out this lie because it serves my purpose. The first mode says, well, it, it, there's some truth in here. Um, and. And, and I, the, the level, there's enough truth in here for me to feel positive about this um, and for me to, to, to pass it on. Um, yeah, it may not be completely true. And so, that, so it matters less. So it's, it's softer, but Abdul Murray goes on to say that he thinks actually that's more dangerous because it's more insidious. It's, it's harder to spot because then there's, there's some element of truth in it very often. Uh, Jonathan Friedland said, in the era of post-truth politics, an unhesitating liar can be king. Uh, that's um, an article that he wrote back in May 2016 in the middle of the, uh, the Brexit and uh, American presidential campaigns. A very interesting article, still well worth reading, even though history, of course, has, has moved on quite a long way uh, in the two years since he said that. Um, but the idea that an unhesitating liar can, can get to the top, can... can can succeed um, because of that willingness just to do whatever it takes uh, is uh, it's quite a stark reminder. And so we're in a situation described by Jeremiah, truth has perished, it is banished from the lips. So uh, that's some of the causes of fake news, um, political agendas, greed, uh, the need for virality, just sheer carelessness and the post-truth climate. How does it actually spread? There's a number of psychological and sociological factors. The first is psychological, um, is that fake news spreads because it creates an emotional connection with us. Um, the, the rider on, a, on an elephant comes, metaphor comes from Jonathan Friedland, um, who is um, a 
psychologist, if I remember rightly, um, one of the, uh, the most highly rated TED Talks on um, um, the, the Righteous Mind, and he has a book called The, the Righteous Mind. Uh, and he talks about how um, in our decision-making processes, there are two parts of us. There's an emotional part, that's the elephant, and actually that's 85%, he, he says, uh, of, our, of our responding to things. And then there's this little bit, the rider stuck on top of the elephant, which is the rational part of our brains. And um, if, we, if we come across something, that elephant is going to decide whether it likes it or whether it doesn't like it. And the rider has to work really hard to overcome that, that emotional response. If that elephant um, comes across uh, something and says, I don't like that, that elephant's going to run. And, and the rider has to say, no, no, it's, it's broccoli. It's good for you. you know, you've, got to, you've got to get over this dislike of broccoli. Um, but that can be really hard. So anybody who's tried to feed young kids with, with their you know, bizarre dislikes for things that are perfectly reasonable to the rest of the world, um, it's an emotional response. And you're trying to encourage the rider to, to get over that. But the elephant is just too strong. Um, or, or the elephant might say, bananas, bananas, I want some bananas. And, and the rider says, you know, wants to say, no, bananas are OK in moderation, but 300 bananas a day are not good for you. Uh, I finally learned that lesson. Not that I ate 300 a day, but I did have something of a banana addiction for a while. Um, so we, we're carried along by this emotional response. Um, and the, the rational bit often gets subdued. We like to think that all of our decision making is purely rational. You know, we're very clever people. We're very rational, cool, calm, collected. The reality is, is that emotions play a big part. So we share things that create a response in us. They make us laugh or cry or whatever. And that can create an information cascade. So the chap over here, he shares with four of his friends. They share with four of his friends. And in no time at all, you've got a, a, a cascading amount of information going out. It's just reaching more and more people. It multiplies at each stage. Uh, and of course, sharing with four people who share with four people, that's very small scale. Um, there's a, a, a number of famous case studies of information cascades, uh, again, focused on the, uh, the US uh, America, uh, presidential election. Um, one in particular about um, protesters being bused into a particular city. Um, a guy saw some buses, couldn't figure out what those buses were doing there, took a photo, shared it on his Twitter feed with his 42 followers. Um, saying protesters are being bussed in because he knew there was some anti-Trump protest going on in, in this particular town. And by, so that was early evening. By 9 a.m. the following morning, um, it had been shared 300,000 times on, 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 on just on Reddit, as well as on Facebook and, and all sorts of other things. It, it had just cascaded. And then he realized the following day that actually those buses were there for an IT, some, some very techie conference of a, of a company. They're busting their employees from all over uh, the USA. And, and the buses were there for that. And so he said, he, he, he went public and he said, I was wrong. Th they were there for a completely different reason. I, I'm sorry. This got out of hand. I, I just didn't check. I didn't think. Uh, but of course, the trouble is that that initial thing created emotional response in people. <gasps> they can't do that. That's outrageous. Click, share, click, like, click, angry. Uh, and, and it spreads like wildfire. Him saying, oh, sorry, my bad. It was a tech conference. You know, who cares? Nobody's interested. So that doesn't spread because it doesn't generate the emotional response. So the combination of the emotional response and the way that social media works is you get this cascade of information. That's related to the idea of social proof. We value things because other people have already valued them, particularly people within our social circle. So you go to a new town, you're looking for somewhere to eat, two restaurants side by side, one is packed and one is empty. There's got, just got one couple in this other restaurant. You think, everybody's in that restaurant, there's only two people in that restaurant, there's something wrong with the food there. So you, go, you try to go to the busy one, you, you get the last available table in the busy restaurant and then discover that actually it's only full because the chef is having a family party and he knows absolutely everybody that's in there and that the best restaurant for 25 miles around is, is the other one. And if you'd arrived five minutes earlier, you wouldn't got a, have got a seat. Um, but everybody just happens to have left. Um, uh, so that the social proof is really important to us. 
So when we're buying things on Amazon or we're booking a holiday, we look for the reviews on TripAdvisor or the, the Amazon reviews. 10% of Amazon reviews have been shown to be fake. Uh, and yet still, we, we, if it hasn't got four stars, we think, oh, it's probably not that good. Um, and, um, and, and especially on, on Facebook, if we can see that our friends, that Facebook are constantly doing this to you. Three of your friends have liked this website or this group or this web Facebook page. Um, and because some of your friends who you trust like it, you think, oh, it must be okay. So social proof is, is important. So if you see some false information and it's been shared by three million people, you're inclined to believe it more than if you see a piece of information that's been shared by three people. But the fact that it's been shared by three million people doesn't make it more likely to be true. Uh, and then there's uh, the idea of confirmation bias. or It's a, a psychological bias that, um, that all of us have. There's a number of psychological biases in our thinking, but confirmation bias is a particularly uh, important one. So we are attracted to information that reinforces the, the, the ideas and beliefs that we already have. If it fits into our framework of knowledge or our framework of belief, then we can accommodate it very easily. If it challenges that, then we're, we are going to be more resistant to it. And there's some value here. This, this is a, a, an important filtering process. The world is full of information. We can't take it all on board. Um, and we don't want to, to take on board a whole load of information that undermines everything that we believe. So there's, there's some sensible filtering going on here. But the, the fact that it's an instinctive bias does make it really difficult for us because we are attracted to those facts that fit in with our beliefs. Those are the things that we like. And we tend to not, we tend to overlook or re actively reject those facts, even if they're solid, well-researched facts. We we under we we reject them or ignore them if they don't fit in. And of course, as as Christians, we can be in, inclined to do this because uh, we we see Richard Dawkins, the atheist, saying something or other, and it doesn't fit with our with our Christian convictions, and so instantly we reject reject it just because uh, it's Richard Dawkins. Well, he talks a lot of nonsense, so there's... Sorry if you're watching this, Richard Dawkins. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, I think I do believe as a Christian that, that much of what he says is demonstrably um, uh, rubbish. <laughs> um, but, it, but it can mean that we reject things that he says that, that, are, that actually are true because we, we, it's possible for us to be wrong about stuff. I passionately believe the Bible to be true, but that my interpretation of the Bible is not going to be true at all points because I'm still a fallible, finite, fallen human being. I get things wrong. I, th there are blind spots in my thinking. Um, and so I can be resistant to things that actually help me to, to get closer to the truth. Um, and uh, all of that adds up to uh, the well-known um, phenomenon of filter bubbles, a term coined by Eli Pariser from Upworthy in um, a TED talk, I think it was in 2011, 2012, in which he pleaded with um, Zuckerberg and uh, the heads of um, Google and Yahoo to say, please do something to your algorithm so, so that we are presented with information that, that expands our thinking rather than simply reinforces because you, you've created an algorithm, a way of feeding us information that, that reinforces the confirmation bias. We like stuff, we've liked a whole load of stuff on Facebook, and so you give us more stuff that is like the things that we've liked on Facebook. And there's never anything to go across that. So I was one of many people in the Brexit um, uh, referendum in the UK who was astonished the day of the result because on my social media feed, I thought if this is very clearly going one way. Uh, and I have a few friends who think the opposite. Well, they're clearly in the minority. And the, then the following morning, oh, uh, that, uh, the, the result was pretty close, actually. It was about 151, 49%, something like that. Um, so it wasn't quite as close as some people were expecting, but it was, it, it was closer than I thought it was going to be. And, and my friends on the other side of the fence, it was closer than many of them thought it was going to be because they thought from their social media feeds that everybody was going to vote the other way. Um, so we were living in our filter bubbles. Uh, this guy is Michael Lynch, who is a philosopher from um, 
a university somewhere in America, and I can't remember which one off, off the top of my head. It'll come to me while we're watching it, probably. Um, so, so Michael Lynch is a, a, a philosopher, and he, this is a TED talk that he gave about how to find truth. And uh, so he, uh, this is just a little segment of that in which, which he's talking about this phenomenon of filter bubbles and how our smartphones uh, play into that. So imagine that you had your smartphone miniaturized and hooked up directly to your brain. Now, if you had this sort of brain chip, you'd be able to upload and download to the internet at the speed of thought. Accessing social media or Wikipedia would be a lot like, well, from the inside at least, like consulting your own memory. It would be as easy and as intimate as thinking. But would it make it easier for you to know what's true? Just because a way of accessing information is faster doesn't mean it's more reliable, of course, and it doesn't mean that we would all interpret it the same way. And it doesn't mean that you would be any better at evaluating it. In fact, it might even be worse because, you know, more data, less time for evaluation. You know, something like this is already happening to us right now. We already carry a world of information around in our pockets. But it seems as if the more information that we share and access online, the more difficult it can be for us to tell the difference between what's real and what's fake. It's as if we know more, but understand less. Now, you know, it's a feature of modern life, I suppose, that large swaths of the public live in isolated information bubbles. You know, we're polarized, not just over values, but over the facts. And one reason for that is that the data analytics that drive the internet get us not just more information, but more of the information that we want. Our online life is personalized. Everything from the ads we read to the news that comes down our Facebook feed is tailored to satisfy our preferences. And so while we get more information, a lot of that information ends up reflecting ourselves as much as it does reality. It ends up, I suppose, inflating our bubbles rather than bursting them. And so maybe it's no surprise that we're in a situation, a paradoxical situation, of thinking that we know so much more and yet not agreeing on what it is we know. So how are we going to solve this problem of knowledge polarization? So what are the consequences of, of fake news? Uh, firstly, is a loss of truth. Uh, if we are just trading untruths or, or half-truths, if we're just chucking these backwards and forwards across the, the, the political um, in, uh, battle lines, um, it, it becomes impossible to know who's telling the truth. If all we're hearing is claim and counterclaim and counter-counterclaim and undermining of the counter-counterclaim and counter-undermining of the... You know, it's... And, and everybody saying, no, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. This is fake news. No, your fake news is fake news. And fake news has become a term of abuse um, uh, for something that I don't like. And it becomes impossible in that kind of context, or very difficult, to, to, to discover what's true. And actually, people become apathetic about discovering what's true. Oh, there's just so much. You can't believe anybody. I'm just giving up. Um, uh, second, that leads to social fragmentation. We already had a, pol a politically polarized environment, at least speaking for the UK, um, uh, and, and that has become massively more polarized since the Brexit campaign, it seems to me. Uh, North American politics seems to me to be uh, very polarized, uh, even on issues that once upon a time were bipartisan issues. Um, it, it, politics has become more polarized, as I understand it from, from what I read online, in, in, in Germany and in, uh, in Norway and it, it just so many other places. Uh, and so if things become polarized, if we can't agree what's, on, what's, what's true, society begins to break down and, and we begin to uh, just gather in, in, in little tribes and a bit of news or counterfeit news or whatever is our flag to, to show our allegiance to a particular tribe. And it doesn't mean anything more than that. Uh, and then, of course, along... Well, let me give you this quotation from Isaiah first. I think this captures our situation very well. Justice is driven back. Righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Doesn't that sound exactly like the kind of context that we have around us at the moment? 
Uh, thirdly, is a loss of identity. If, if truth is undermined, if we live in a, a post-truth world where uh, feelings matter more than what's actually true, that doesn't give you a secure basis for identity because feelings, of course, are, are fickle. If we allow ourselves to be carried along by the elephant, um, you can have good days and bad days and, and, and your identity is all over the place um, because the rider on the elephant is not having a, a significant part. If, if the social scene has become fragmented um, uh, and your little group suddenly is undermined by something that happens, that can be devastating to your, your sense of identity. There just aren't the foundations for people to be able to build a firm sense of identity on. Um, this is a quotation I came across a, a few years back now, uh, which is um, just incredibly heartbreaking, I think. I belong to the blank generation. I have no beliefs. I belong to no community, tradition, or anything like that. I'm lost in this vast, vast world. I belong nowhere. I have absolutely no identity. Uh, an anonymous uh, comment, I think quoted in a book by Walter Stewart Anderson um, a few years back, uh, but it's just heartbreaking. Uh, but I don't think that person is alone. I think that's a pretty common feeling, uh, but just stating it very starkly. Uh, fourthly, a fourth consequence, a surprising one, is I think there's some resistance. I think there's some pushback um, to this. Uh, I don't want to overplay this, but I think there are some signs of hope. Um, this is Catherine Viner, who is the current editor-in-chief of The Guardian uh, in uh, the UK. The truth is a struggle, she says. It takes hard graft, but the struggle is worth it. Traditional news values are important, and they matter, and they're worth defending. So The, the Guardian uh, is a, a very interesting newspaper in terms of its approach. Um, it does sell online advertising, but they refuse to put up a paywall. What they do when you go to the Guardian website is they ask you to donate. It's become a, a crowdsourced um, uh, journalism, effectively. They still sell physical newspapers, they still sell advertising, but they, they're looking for supporters. And actually, the numbers of supporters they're getting are going up because people are saying, we want journalism. It's actually, despite the, um, it being a poor quarter for the New York Times at the end of 2017, the New York Times and the Washington Post and a number of other of the, the classic newspapers, both sides of the Atlantic, are finding their circulation is beginning to go up again because people are saying, enough of this nonsense that's out there. I want some good old fashioned journalism done by people who have standards of integrity and journalistic quality. So maybe there's some pushback. Crucially, though, how do we respond to fake news? Uh, there's a number of things that I think that we need to do as Christians. Firstly, we need to develop a passion for the truth. Christians, of all people in the world, should be passionate about truth. We should be, um, like Paul, when he, when he goes to Athens in Acts chapter 17, Paul was distressed to see that the city was full of idols. We should be distressed to see, look around at our culture and see that it's full of idols, and to see that our public space is full of fake news and untruth and post-truth. Um, we should be distressed about that, and we should be passionate about truth because we follow the one who is the personification of truth. Twice in John chapter 1, John says that Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. Uh, John 8, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's often taken out of context uh, and, and, and meant to apply to, to truth in, in a general sense. Knowing any truth will set you free. And, and actually, I think that that's, there's some validity in that because uh, I think it was Calvin who first said all truth is God's truth. Um, I think Amy uh, or Ewing uh, in a seminar yesterday said Dorothy L. Sayers said it before Schaefer, but I think Calvin was there before Dorothy L. Sayers. I'm pretty sure it's in, 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 in his institutes. Not quite in that phrase, but the idea is there that if it's true, it, it's true because God is the God of truth um, and we don't need to be afraid of it. And so there is a sense in which any truth is liberating because it brings us more in line with reality as it actually is with, with reality. Um, uh, but of course, we get to John 14 and Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth. He is the truth that sets us free, ultimately. So we should be passionate about truth generally because we follow the one who is truth with a capital T. But it is inconvenient. It is unpopular. Uh, it is uh, a very unpleasant place to be following truth in our world and standing for Jesus in our world. It requires courage. 
but we must not flinch from it. Proverbs says, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Are we Christians, people who are trustworthy? It's very easy for us to say, yes, of course we are. But actually, fake news affects us too. And we'll come back to that in a moment if we have time. So we need to live the truth. Part of developing a passion for the truth, part of following the one who is truth, is that we need to live the truth. Truth is not just something that we believe. It needs to be something that we live out. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, two of those, at least, the way and, and the life, there's a sense of progress and development and journey in there. The life is something that we, 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 we're, 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 we're in the way of life. We're, we're experiencing life. We're going through life. We are on the way. And, and the truth is, 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 sounds more like a goal. And of course, they all overlap with each other. Um, but we are, we are to live a Christ-like life because we're Christ people. Um, and so truth should be something that characterizes us deeply, not just in what we believe, but in who we are, in, in what we value, in, um, in what we say, in the way that we, we relate to each other. It's about integrity. We need to commit to discovering what is true. Uh, I am now very ashamed by my failure uh, 11 years ago when I first came across this piece of information about Alabama passing this law about redefining pie. Uh, it turns out it was an April Fool's thing, of all things. How, how, how could I fall for that? Uh, but anyway, there we are. Um, but now it's much easier to check the truth of, of claims that are online because there are sites like Snopes.com where, where there are people who, who know about a particular field and say, no, actually, that's not true. And so Snopes, uh, and there are other fact-checking websites, a very good way of quickly finding that some claim that you come across online um, is, is a hoax that's been circulating on, on the internet, in my case, for 11 years. Um, I'm just glad I haven't passed it on to too many people. And you know, it's just a little anecdote that I've trotted out. It's not something I've passed on in, in print or anything like that. Um, but I should have been more committed to discovering truth then, just checking that out. Um, Roger Olson, in an article uh, on uh, patheos.com, uh, tail end of 2016, I think he wrote this. He says, I also point an accusing finger at many Christians who, it seems to me, simply don't care about truth as much as they care about feelings. It's exactly the post-truth definition. If a doctrine, for example, doesn't feel right, then it is at best unimportant. If an ethical stance seems hurtful, e.g. not nice or intolerant, it must be wrong. Uh, and I'm seeing this in so much of our Christian discussion online that people say, that's, I, I don't like that, or that makes me feel very uncomfortable. And, and are questioning the authority of scripture uh, even be, because it's uncomfortable in the contemporary world. Um, you may have picked up on some of the discussion about uh, Bishop Curry's sermon at the Royal Wedding uh, in the UK on Saturday. It was. Um, uh, I, I didn't hear it, but it, it, it seems to be quite polarized. A lot of people were saying that was lovely, heartwarming, passionate sermon. Uh, and some Christians are saying, I don't care if it's heartwarming and passionate and lovely. He actually wasn't pointing to the truth of the gospel. Um, um, but, it, but it felt right to many people because of the way that he was, he was speaking. So uh, we need to be careful. Um, now, this is Jimmy Kimmel, who... Is somebody I would have expected to be a real postmodernist, not somebody who particularly cares about truth. But this is a fascinating little segment from from his uh, his show on uh, American television, in which um, again this comes from the, uh, the the time of the American presidential campaign. Um, uh, but he and he's picking up on on a tweet from Donald Trump. But he goes on to make a very important truth about point uh, about point about truth in a very simple uh, and quite powerful way. Donald Trump took to Twitter today. I know, I was surprised too, but he, um, <laughs> he has an account, I guess. Yesterday on Twitter, Trump seemed to be siding with Julian Assange, that weirdo WikiLeaks guy who's on the run from the government. He sided with Assange over the FBI and CIA. Assange said he did not get 
the leaked emails from the Russians, and Trump very much wants to believe that. And this morning, he lashed out on Twitter. He said, the dishonest media like saying I am in agreement with Julian Assange. Wrong. I simply state what he states. It is for the people to make up their own minds as to the truth. The media lies to make it look like I am against intelligence, when in fact, I am a big fan. <laughs> Of intelligence. He's a big fan of. He's, <laughs> he's a big fan of intelligence and golf. And, but the part that jumped out of me is where he said it's for the people to make up their own minds as to the truth, which is a weird thing to say because no, it isn't. It's you can't make up your mind about the truth. <laughs> the truth is the truth. The truth isn't. Tr if the truth isn't true, it's not the truth. Like if NASA says the Earth is round, someone says it's flat. That's not a difference of opinion. The earth is round. <laughs> One thing is true and the other, let me give you an example. Uh, bring in the coffee cart here, because, okay, so here we go, all right. So, uh, hi, how you doing? I'd like a um, grande cappuccino, please. Okay, grande cappuccino, that'll be 375. No, it won't. <laughs> yes, it will. Why, because you think your opinion matters more than mine? No, because that's the price. Mm. Well, your opinion is that it's three seventy-five. My opinion is that it costs one dollar. But, but it doesn't cost a dollar. It's three seventy-five. I don't have time to debate you right now. I have a Zumba class in half an hour. I just want the coffee for a dollar, okay? The price is right there on the sign. Oh, great! It's on the sign. Who wrote that sign? Did you write the sign? I know I didn't write. Did anyone here write that sign? <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you what. You got to uh, here now. The sign says cappuccino is a dollar. So here's a dollar. Please give me my cappuccino. Thank you. I need you to pay $3.75, sir. I need you to know that the truth is for the people to decide for ourselves. <laughs> now, please give me my cappuccino. Thank you very much. Got a cappuccino for Timmy. Well, it's no, it's Jimmy, but. Not in my opinion, it isn't. <laughs> I see. see. Thank you, guys. I think we learned a lot, right? <laughs> truth is truth. Um, and, um, and, and the people who, who downplay the importance of truth, actually, you turn the tables and it, and it, and the, and it doesn't work for them. You know, they, we, we all want the world to work on our terms. Um, and, and the truth enables everybody to work on terms of the truth, not on whether my terms are better than your terms. You know, I want it to be a dollar and you want my name to be Timmy. Um, uh, and when it goes the other way, it doesn't, he, he's less comfortable with it. Um, so um, yeah, we, we must be passionate uh, about the truth. Uh, we need to engage our brains, not just our emotions. We need to realize that, uh, that, this, uh, that this elephant is a, a powerful beast. The emotional part of our brains is very powerful and will, will make us respond to things um, quickly, and and it will it will uh, prompt us to to click the like button or to click the share button, and that elephant is likely to make us do that based on the headline and the picture without us ever reading the content. We need to get that rider back in control and to engage our brains and to say, I'm not just going to share this because I like the picture and the headline, and it makes me feel either warm and fuzzy or it's filled me with outrage, which is the classic things get passed on because of outrage more than anything else. Um, so we've, we've got to engage our brains and, and make sure that we read things and understand what's actually being said um, so that we can say, oh, no, this is not something I want to share. This is, I don't think this is true. Yeah, I understand where this person is coming from, but, but this is, there's, there's something that's not right about this. This is only partly true. Or... Um, uh, or actually, I'm only responding to this because, because it's taking up a particular position and I can't verify whether this is true or not. I'm not going to share it. So we need to, uh, to engage our brains, not just our emotions. We need to actively resist our confirmation bias, therefore. Uh, recognize that we have this instinctive tendency to value information that already fits with what we believe. And we have to, to take active steps to, to go beyond that and, and to expose ourselves to things outside of our filter bubble. Um, so we, we need to, if we're concerned for truth, we need to be reading things not just from our particular little corner of the world, 
but from people who have different political perspectives from ours, different, different theological perspectives than ours. Uh, I'm passionately, you know, passionate as an evangelical. We evangelicals haven't got everything right. Uh, and, and so I want to be able to, to, to read things by other people, to discover where am I blind? What am I missing? What am I getting wrong? Um, so in all sorts of areas of life, we, we need to, um, to do that. And so break out of the filter bubbles. We need to talk to people across the divides. That I, I was saying the other day um, to the media communicators group about this, this embattled situation say within the political sphere, but in so many other areas of life, sexuality and, and so many others. And the middle ground has gone. And somebody said to me, is it such a bad thing that the middle ground has gone? Because in many issues, there's either true or it's not true, the sexuality thing. It, the Bible's position is clear. And you can, you, know, you can make attempts to reinterpret that, but you're really not doing justice to scripture. And he said, there is no middle ground. Well, no, I, that's right. It's not that there's, there's a, some gray middle ground where, where everything becomes relative, but there is, a, there is a space between the two positions where we can talk to each other and, and seek to understand each other and seek to uh, engage with each other with grace and with, with truth. Os Guinness talks about the, um, the public square was once a religious public square. Um, the, the, the secularization has pushed it to be a naked public square where, where religion has no place. And he says what we need is a civil public square where we can talk about issues um, calmly and, and reasonably. And, and, and so that's the middle ground that we need to find. So that requires us to break out of our filter bubbles, going the wrong way. Uh, we, we need to expose untruth. I think I've probably said enough about, about that already. Part of developing a passion for truth is that we find out what is true when we discover it's not true. We must say, I'm sorry, it was wrong. I wish I knew the people that I'd told this thing about the Alabama law about pi to, so that I could now say to them, I'm sorry, it was untrue. It's, it's too late for that. Um, but if I, if I do fall for something online, then I, um, I always make a point of, uh, of making sure that I, that I put something up saying, this was not true. Please, if you've passed this on, please tell them. I know it's not gonna get the same traction as the original thing. Um, but we, we have to show where, where there is untruth. And that requires us to be critically reflective on, on what we're reading, not just taking everything um, that we read at face value. We need to challenge false claims uh, and, and distortions as well. So something could be partly true, but it could be a distortion of the truth. We need to therefore also engage constructively, finding that, that middle space where we can talk and say, <laughs> Um, I, the, 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 I think actually there's some things that you said, just said it there that are, that are not true. Let, but let's, let's talk about this. Let's find out what is true. Let's find out what the real issues are. Um, and, and present a biblical perspective into that space. Uh, it was great hearing from Peter Saunders last night. Peter has done such extraordinary work in the UK media, uh, going on to sometimes very hostile uh, uh, interviews to present a biblical case on sexuality and end of life issues and, and so on. And he's able to expose the untruths that are out there because he's done a lot of research. He knows the stuff. Uh, he's able to do it with grace. He's completely unflappable. Nothing riles him, uh, but he's able to present graciously a biblical perspective. I think he's a master at the job uh, of doing that. One last thing I'll say just before I stop is uh, something from Elizabeth Oldfield, who is the director of the Theos Think Tank in uh, the UK. Um, she's written some stuff recently and has started a new podcast about six months ago called The Sacred Podcast, in which she interviews people, some of them Christians, many of them not Christians, intellectuals in the UK. Uh, she talks to them about what they hold sacred. And she's not meaning in a religious sense, what is it that, that you hold uh, so dear, so it's so precious to you, so important to value that you would be really offended if somebody said, you need to give that up. I'll give you money to give that up. And you just, you just wouldn't go there because it's, it's so precious. And she says, we need to recognize what, holds, what people hold sacred and, and discuss that. In other words, get underneath all of the claims and the counterclaims and the fake news. Why is somebody sharing a piece of fake news? What is, their, what is it that they hold sacred that's prompting them to do that? 
if we can get underneath to get to that, then we'll have a, a much more intelligent conversation where we can present a much, excuse me, a much richer biblical perspective. Uh, this is the definition of the sacred from Gordon Lynch, which is where she picked it up from in the first place. He's a practical theologian in the UK. He says, the sacred is what people take to be absolute realities that exert a profound moral claim over their lives. Sacred forms generate their own visions of evil, the profane, and establish moral boundaries beyond which lie people who are regarded as inhuman or animals. He's putting it quite strongly. She doesn't put it quite so strongly. But what is it that people are so attached to? And if we can get to that... Even in social media, just stop and think, engage the brain, forget the emotions, engage the brain, try and understand what is it that's driving this in the first place? Why has somebody shared this? And then engage with those values rather than the, uh, than the fake claims.